Umiak-1 is the lifeline to a remote nickel mine on Canada's east coast. And the mine desperately needs supplies. This ship has to get there. It's a never-ending battle, a worry on board. Fighting through storms and swells, she'll return with a $100 million cargo. If something had to go wrong, you don't have a lot of room for error. Out here in the ice, Umiak-1 is on her own. Umiak-1 is the most powerful ice-breaking bulk carrier in the world. Driven by the largest single engine in Canada, she sails just one route, the 2,100 kilometers between Quebec City and the Voises Bay nickel mine in northeastern Labrador. From Quebec, she brings the supplies needed to sustain the miners and keep the mine working. Then she returns again, loaded with up to 30,000 tons of nickel concentrate, a haul worth more than $100 million. She makes this round trip at least once a month, no matter what the weather. Every journey is a heavy duty obstacle course for Captain Dean Rose. We're up here operating about the four or five months in the winter out of a year, so the guys are used to the cold, they don't mind it, and uh, they do a good job, a really good job. In 2006, Captain Rose was first officer on Umiak One's maiden voyage. Four years later, he was given command. Captain Rose hails from the rugged Atlantic Canadian province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and so does almost everyone else on board. It's nice to work with a, a bunch of guys from your own province. Uh, our accent, as you can tell, is, is, is pretty strong, so. Uh, we got no trouble to understand each other. Outsiders might have trouble. <laughs> All right, how you doing on forward, Ken? Umiak-1 sails in every season, but this is the most treacherous time of the year. The end of March is very unpredictable. It basically boils down to a day-to-day -day or an hour-to-hour -hour, uh, forecast. So uh, one minute it can be a uh, flat calm, and the next minute it can be uh, gusting up to 35, 40 knots. It's 4 p.m. in Quebec City, just four hours before Captain Rose must leave on the five-day voyage. Are they going to start number three, Hatch, now? The person responsible for loading the 1,400 tons of cargo on board is Chief Officer Kent Waddleton. Uh, we want to get out of here on time. We want to make our next perk so we can uh, proceed north. 2,100 kilometers away, 250 miners are waiting for these goods. Today, the ship is loaded with everything from frozen vegetables to diesel oil, to cables, to these 19-ton trucks. Stretching 189 meters, Umiak-1 is the queen of multitasking. She's an icebreaker. Her reinforced hull can crush ice ridges 10 meters thick. She's a bulk carrier. Her four holes can haul up to 30,000 tons of loose cargo, like minerals or grain. She's a mini oil tanker, able to carry 7,000 cubic meters of fuel to power the mine. And her three cranes can load up to 152 containers on deck. Leave about, uh, five feet. This cargo needs to remain lashed down for the next four to five days. You got enough room to drive off? Yes, yes, we can drive off. We need to make sure it's well lashed because uh, we can get into some uh, rough weather. Post Labrador in the wintertime is going be a nasty place sometimes. My job is going to back up a little bit. Okay. Woo! We got a 19 ton back truck getting loose on the deck. It could do a lot of damage. By 6 p.m., the trucks, cables, and other cargo, plus 105 containers, are stowed on board. But the loading isn't over. Yeah, 
Captain Rose and harbour pilot Bruno Leblanc guide Umiak 1 towards a second dock five kilometres away. A tugboat does the heavy pulling. At this second berth, the ship has to pick up two final containers. Docking here is usually a routine procedure, but what should be a quick stopover is proving difficult. Just left the guillotine job. In late March, ice is no surprise, but today the ice is stuck in place and blocking the ship's path. Normally with the current, you'll just be patient and let the ice move with the current or either the wind, but today the wind and the current are completely opposite, though that makes it a little bit difficult. So. A serious delay here could mean a big delay in getting to the mine. Captain Rose and pilot Leblanc call on a tugboat to flush away the ice. It's not a quick fix. Dead slow ahead. Dead slow ahead. It's a slow process having to flush the ice and it's a pain to have to deal with, but it's winter time. It's that, it's that time of year and there's no other choice but to deal with it. In no time, the weather has gone from good to grey, and it's only going to get worse. In a matter of an hour, we've got fairly heavy snow here now. I checked the weather earlier, and it uh, looks like there's a low-pressure low system moving in. So I'd like to be out clear uh, in fairly open water by the time it hits to give us a little bit of a leeway for tonight. Three and a half feet, Roger. Thank you. Every second lost here delays Umiak 1's departure and makes it even more likely she'll be hit by the looming storm. Roger, how's your speed back after, Martin? Good, nice to see. Almost up. Three feet. About one foot from there. Perfect. A little bit slow, but slow means safe. Getting through this ice was tough enough, but there's plenty more waiting ahead. On the dock, Kent and his crew start hoisting aboard the last two loads. Just want to make sure it comes in smoothly, uh, doesn't bang into any containers. But time is tight. The captain wants to cast off in just over 60 minutes. Down below, the engineering crew revs up the engine for the five-day voyage. Engine room, Rex. One hour's notice for departure. Okay, Martin, thanks. All right, bye-bye. We'll watch our temperatures and our pressures, make sure that everything's coming up uh, evenly. On land or sea, this is the largest single engine in Canada. With 30,000 horsepower and seven cylinders, it measures nearly 13 meters tall and weighs 663 tons. You have to climb up to inspect Hertz. You actually have to climb down. And just the sheer size of the engine itself is, uh, makes her special. Every aspect of the engine operates on a gigantic scale. The stroke of the piston alone is an amazing four and a half meters. And because Umiak 1 travels unescorted through isolated waters, the engine can never, ever be allowed to break down. When we get up in ice, if anything goes wrong with this engine, we're by ourselves. There's no other ship that can get to where we're going. Boom up, boom up, boom up. Whoa! Yes. Up above, Kent has good news. The loading is complete. Umiak 1 is ready to leave for the Voises Bay mine. We finished just under our uh, time. We had a lot of, at both perks, so uh, everything's going good. We should be, uh, should be able to get underway uh, by 8 o'clock, 20 hundred. It knows to get on the go. It's enough time in port. We'll see how it goes day by day. Hopefully everything's going to go good. In clear weather, the journey takes about four days. But March in eastern Canada means howling winds, rough seas, and fighting through thick ice. Umiak 1 can't back down. 250 lives depend on her making it to the mine. And a $100 million cargo awaits. Loaded with critical supplies, 
Umiak 1 makes her way through the Gulf of St. Lawrence to a nickel mine in Labrador on Canada's east coast. She's so far away from any other sea traffic, her only company is a plane from the Canadian government's environment ministry, here to survey ice conditions. Umiak 1 takes her name from the northern Aboriginal word for a large sealskin boat, traditionally used to transport families and equipment on hunting and whaling expeditions. This modern-day Umiak moves a different kind of family and cargo. And she always travels alone, completely dependent on her one and only engine. This engine's my baby and I want to make sure she stays in top shape. Chief engineer Gary Bishop is responsible for maintaining the largest engine in Canada. Since we haven't made it up to the ice ship, it's easy sailing at the moment. This is the time to check all of our systems out to make sure that there is no problems, because we don't want to have any problems once we hit the ice. Gary's team spends every day on the lookout for trouble. And today, third engineer Rex Domini finds it. We've got a fuel pump leaking on number three generator. Number three fuel pump. If not handled immediately, small problems can escalate into major disasters. With hot fuel in on the engine like that, it's possible we could have a fire. With a lot of fuel, we can also have a loss of power. And uh, if the standby generator doesn't respond quickly enough, we could have a blackout. Pretty good. So we'll the crew must take the generator offline to repair the leak. And go ahead and shut down number three. Umiak-1 relies on three diesel-powered generators to supply all of her electricity. These generators ensure that fuel keeps pumping to the engine, computers keep running, and cranes keep lifting. They power everything, right down to the desk lamps. But the generators are never all used at the same time. One is always set aside as a backup. So Mike is uh, getting the generator ready to start? He's going to start up number two. All right, perfect. While one generator is shut down, another is brought online to keep the power flowing and the engine running. Gary's crew tackles the leaking fuel pump and the ship continues on her way, without losing a minute. Key with any of these issues is that we identify them quickly, keep everything under control. As Gary's team toils down below, the crew on the bridge prepares for an emergency drill. OK, roger that. They do this every three months. There's going to be the port side. A junior officer, Ashton Regular, will steer the ship to practice rescuing someone who's fallen overboard. A plastic boy stands in for the unlucky sailor. Ashton is at the wheel for the first time. He's a, he's a new joiner that just joined the ship uh, back in Quebec City. It's like taking a new car for a ride. As part of his training, the new joiner is given a big test. Ashton must execute a Williamson turn, a rescue maneuver involving extreme and sudden steering actions with the rudder to bring the ship back alongside the man overboard as quickly as possible. Watch your head. When everyone's ready, Captain Dean Rose gives the signal. Go ahead, Ken. OK, roger that. Get some lookouts and get the, uh, get the rescue boat ready to go. At this time of year, survival in these freezing waters is measured in mere minutes. Approaching 223, Captain. Midships. Midships. Uh, we'll Ashton makes a textbook, Williamson turn. Roger, I got a visual as well. Yeah, go ahead, Luke. It doesn't boat. hurt that Umiak-1 is a dream to steer. Ship, uh, to create a leaf, we're going to launch the boat to get them. Roger, Captain, roger. The ship is 630 feet long, but she turns as if she's 150 feet. It's uh, it's quite amazing that uh, she's so maneuverable. Because of the size of the rudder, this thing turns very, very fast. This is like uh, a Porsche compared to what I'm used to. He should be just fine on the starboard bow or now, Kent. Fine on the starboard bow. The ship and her crew have passed a big test. Should the real thing occur, they'll be ready. Day two, and Umiak-1 is about to leave the Gulf of St. Lawrence and sail through the Strait of Belle Isle, heading northwest up the Labrador coast. 
Now, the hard graft begins. All right, Martin, I just got the uh, latest weather and ocean information coming for our, uh, for our trip north. The ship sails through all kinds of ice. First and second year ice, which is easy to break through. Older and tougher multi-year ice. Landfast ice, attached to the coast, and free-floating ice. The ice can range from a few centimetres thick to ridges 15 metres high. And then, of course, there are icebergs. But no matter what the form, shape or age, Umiak-1 takes on everything that comes her way. She has a strong, uh, she's a good sea boat, and uh, she's, she's made for us, so... Her hull is reinforced to ride up and crush ice ridges more than 10 metres thick. And it's coated with a special low-friction paint to help ice and snow slide off. In heavy conditions, she can also spray her path with thousands of litres of water to soften the ice and snow. But even with all these defences, ice remains a constant threat. The ship had to come up and a piece of old ice go beneath the, uh, beneath the bow of the ship. You risk, uh, you risk damaging the ship. On her second evening at sea, Umiak-1 sails into rough weather. The ice conditions that were forecasted is not close to what, uh, what we're experiencing. Moving through the narrow Strait of Belle Isle, she hits a northeasterly wind that jams chunks of ice and snow into her path, creating a bottleneck in the narrow space. So right here is the bottleneck area. The wind is blowing this way, so everything is concentrated in this area here. Sailing through the bottleneck, the ship drags some 30 metres of ice on either side of her hull. And right now, the snow was just zapping the speed. We're down to about five knots. Captain Rose wants to get to the mine in the next three days. At this speed, that's not going to happen. Patience is very important when you're navigating in ice. Good evening, Captain. At midnight, evening, Chief Officer Kent Waddleton takes over for the captain. Too bad now. Start just keep a good eye on to it. There might be a few icebergs in around this area as well. With low visibility, right. icebergs in the area, and a few tons of sea ice along for the ride, it looks like Umiak-1 is in for a long, tough fight. Umiak-1 is three days away from her destination, the Voices Bay Nickel Mine in eastern Canada. The world's most powerful ice-breaking bulk carrier is about to leave open coastal waters behind and sail where only she can, the ice fields off the coast of Labrador. If there's an emergency now, she's on her own. I'm just going to go up and have a look at the ice age to see if, uh, see if it's safe to proceed in. Uh, we'll reduce our speed to about six knots. Take a look, a little bit beat up, I guess, with all the wind that we've had the last couple of days. Pushing through ice makes huge demands on the ship's engine. It's already running at a standard 72 revolutions per minute, but that's not nearly enough to break through the ice. For that, Captain Dean Rose needs the ship to be running at full power, 91 RPM. Engine room Rex. Yes, sir. You want 91 RPM? OK, uh, you can take control there with constant RPM, please. All right, thanks. The captain needs his icebreaker to give him all the thrust she can muster. But it won't happen instantly. It's got to be done in increments to allow the engine to warm up. In open water, Umiak-1 burns about 35,000 litres of fuel a day. Ramming through ice, she burns three times that much. As the engine revs up, the effects are felt even high up on the bridge. The vibrations that you're feeling is ice going through the propeller. It's, uh, it's quite common on an icebreaker to feel that you get used to it. Umiak-1 now heads into eastern Canada's inland waters. It's minus 4 degrees Celsius outside, and 40 knot winds are battering the ship. Just another day in Labrador, I guess. Braving the weather, leading seaman Melton Keeping and his crew head out on deck to make sure everything's still locked down. 
Okay, boys, check all the lashings, make sure everything is all tight. Anything loose, make sure it tightens it off. When the cargo has been double checked, Melton then inspects the ice. The ship's foredeck is just over 100 meters long, which means it's difficult for the bridge crew to get a close look. It's hard to get a, a true perspective of how thick the ice is from up here on the bridge, looking at, actually looking down on the ice. Hello, bridge. Yeah, just looking at the ice situation up there, it looks like it's uh, pretty thick there. Probably two, three meters anyway, some of it, and it breaks it up. Over. The ice looks like one solid slab, but it's actually a constantly shifting mass. The ship passed through here only a month ago, but the crew knows the ice is never the same twice. Yeah, slow going, but at least we're going. Yeah, roger that, yeah. Never gets old looking at ice sometimes. Other times you wish you'd never see it again. <laughs> On her fourth day at sea, Umiak Wong gets ready to make one of the most difficult maneuvers of the entire journey. Okay, hard board. On every trip, she has to finesse her way between Whale and Skull Islands. There's less than 500 meters breathing room on each side, and hidden shoals and rocks loom all around her. You're making the turn, something had to, something had to happen with your steering or your, your main engine. It's a good chance you're going to go over ground. Under watchful eyes, Umiak-1 makes the turn as nimbly as a ship half her size. Average 20. The reason the ship turns so fast and is so maneuverable is because of the size of the rudder. They placed a, a very large rudder for ice navigation, so the ship can turn very fast. It turns on the dome, just look. Yeah, it's coming around pretty good. 20, starboard. Captain Rose and Chief Officer Kent Waddleton now begin their next challenge, trying to follow in their own footsteps. We have to try as much as possible to stick to our old track in and out. This may look like empty space, but about 5,000 Inuit call this part of Canada home. Across this land, on this ice, they hunt for caribou, seals and geese. They depend on this region for their survival so the ship must leave the smallest footprint possible. Can you see the track? It's just that fine on the port side. The track is right here. You can see this is a... Right along side of us. This is one of the old tracks running along here. It will be dark in two hours, and following the old track then will be almost impossible. So uh, to be doing that late in the day and uh, possible uh, hours of darkness is, is just not, uh, it's not a risk that we're willing to take. The nickel mine is just seven hours away, but sailing on would mean docking in the middle of the night, and it's hard enough to do by day. Captain Rose decides to stand out until tomorrow. I've been up here on the bridge uh, for 12 hours now, and uh, if we had to continue in, it would be uh, it would be just too long. We wouldn't get there before daylight anyway, so we'll shut down, get a fresh uh, fresh kick at the can tomorrow morning. He leaves the bridge in good hands. She shouldn't uh, she shouldn't move up a wind like this. She was getting pretty good, so. Okay. Right. Right. Yep. Good enough. With the ship's 30,000 horsepower engine shut down for the night, the engine crew can take a look inside for any undue wear and tear. Yeah, it looks, uh, looks really good, eh, Sam? Yeah. But first, some 13 meters below deck, the very bottom of the engine must be cleaned. Hey. Engineering cadets Carl Randall and William T climb inside the massive crankcase for the dirty job of mopping up oil. This is what the job's all about. It's a good learning experience, and that's what we're here for. Yeah, it's really sweltering down there. It's high as evening, and you got probably an uh, inch and a half of oil in a lot of spots down there. You have, you have to be down and roll around that foot. 30,000 litres of oil lubricate the engine. 
the oil drains here to the bottom of the crankcase and then to a sump tank located under the engine. Then it's filtered, cooled and circulated back through the engine. This oil, 30,000 litres, has not changed. It could be good for the life of the ship. We take it, we test it, we send it to a lab and we look after it through the purification process and filters and hopefully we'll never ever have to change the oil. With the oil sopped up, Chief Engineer Gary Bishop gets a clear look at the state of the crankcase. The paint condition gives us indication that there's been any extra stresses on the, uh, on the engine itself. If there's any cracks, I look at all my welds. It's good news. It passes inspection. The next morning, Captain Rose gets ready to head for the Voises Bay mine. More than $100 million worth of nickel concentrate is waiting there to be loaded and shipped back to Quebec City. As soon as we get the engine warmed up now, we'll take her on bridge control and get going. Making her way towards the mine, Umiak-1 leaves a 30-metre-wide trail of broken ice. That trail cuts the hunting and fishing areas of the local Inuit people in two. So the Inuit bridge the gap. It's important for us to hunt and fish on the south side of the track and the north side of the track. As soon as the ship has passed by, they lay down bridges that float on the newly exposed water. These are critical to sustaining the Inuit way of life. These bridges are really important to local travelers, hunters, wooders, fishers. If it wasn't there, I don't know what we would do. Five days after leaving Quebec City, Umiak One's destination is in sight. She has sailed here alone, and now she'll dock alone without any assistance from tugboats or harbor pilots. We've got no bow thruster, we can't use the anchor, and the ice is about 1.3 meters thick. So you're using 30,000 horsepower really close to the dock to try and flush the ice to get the, the ship tied alongside. 210, Eddie, that looks good. Yeah, let me know if she falls one way or another. To reach the dock, the ship needs to break up the ice blocking her approach. Captain Rose changes the engine thrust ahead and astern multiple times, pushing back and forth to clear a path. Perfect. Keep her out of starboard. The captain's greatest weapon in this battle is the ship's 46-ton controllable pitch propeller. On this kind of propeller, the angle or pitch of the blades can be altered. When the blades change their pitch, the ship changes direction without needing to brake or use a reverse gear. Ken, I'm gonna let her come ahead now and, uh, and flush out a little bit if I can there. What I got broke up back here so far. And I'll we'll work the stern back and forth then. All right, very good. A ship this big needs time to change direction. It takes 42 seconds roughly from, for the, uh, the pitch to go from full ahead uh, position to full astern position. So you need to keep that in mind as well when you're trying to flush the ice uh, close to the dock. Hello, Kent. I'm uh, just going to make the approach to the dock there now, Kent. I need you on the bow uh, as soon as you can there. For, uh, this the ship is 189 meters long. The dock is only half of that, and dangerous shoals lie at each end of it. Without a bow thruster, the captain has to navigate carefully. If something had to go wrong, it doesn't, you don't have a lot of room for error. It can get pretty, pretty stressful. I should have that pretty quick here, Captain. Yeah, we're doing a, we're doing a knot. Midships! After an hour-long battle, Umiak-1 finally makes it to the dock. How's she looking, Ken? Hi, Roger, Cap. We're, uh, we're stopped. We're, uh, we're stationary here. I'll let you know if she starts to creep ahead. Roger. Even a veteran like Captain Rose is relieved at the soft landing. No injuries, no damage to any equipment. Didn't touch the dock. Nice and slow, nice and safe. 
Mission accomplished for today. But as day turns to night, the hard work is far from over. Kent and his team have to unload more than 100 massive containers. They carry everything from washing machines to potatoes, anything needed to keep the nickel mine running. The ship's cargo is absolutely critical. The only road up here runs between the pier and the mine. The outside world is a plane, snowmobile or dog sled ride away. OK, slow now, slow. Well, At three in the morning, the job is only half done. Hey, Don, I need you to take this off the dock, OK? Yeah, we got probably about five hours of uh, discharge Fine. left to go. So uh, the guys are going to keep going to Detroit tonight. We don't stop here. Uh, once we get in there and get going, it's just 24-hour operation until everything is done. By dawn, Umiak is almost unloaded and trucks have begun to haul the cargo to the mine. In this part of Canada, the morning traffic is light. Thirteen kilometers from the port, the Voises Bay workers mine one of the planet's most precious metals, nickel. 365 days a year, from frigid winter to blistering summer, the mine never stops. This is the reason Umiak-1 was designed and built. It can travel here year-round, and uh, that's primarily what we need. In a year, the miners dig up a million tons of ore. From that, they extract around 360,000 tons of nickel concentrate. The annual haul is worth billions of dollars. And Umiak-1 is at the very heart of this operation. Everything we produce goes out on Umiak. Basically, we survive with that boat. Nickel is used to make stainless steel. It's precious cargo, but it can also be very dangerous. This type of nickel concentrate is self-heating. If there's too much oxygen in the hold, the nickel could ignite. To prevent this from happening, nitrogen gas is pumped into the hold. This displaces the oxygen through a vent in the hatch cover. No oxygen, no fire. The first cargo hold has now been filled with nickel concentrate. Wait, uh, they just called for the N2 plant. I'm gonna get a generator going. And, uh, it's time to displace the oxygen inside with nitrogen gas. Down below, the engineers start pumping. The gas levels will be monitored for the duration of the return journey. So I got one compressor running there now. As the loading continues, the captain learns he can expect rough seas ahead. I just got the long-term forecast coming earlier today. There it looks like uh, by the time we finish up, it's, uh, there's going to be a storm coming up. So expect another bit of. Uh, rolling around on the way down. We're well used to it. Nobody likes it, but uh, when it happens, we uh, hope for the best. Forewarned is forearmed. Umiak-1 and her crew prepare to sail right into a vicious North Atlantic storm. It's almost four in the morning. Umiak-1 is fully loaded with more than $100 million worth of nickel concentrate and is almost ready to depart for Quebec City. Leaving the dock is a little bit more difficult than actually making the dock. The moment Captain Dean Rose pulls away from the dock, he'll be confronted by a dangerous shoal just 200 meters away. He hopes that by leaving now, during flood tide, he'll have the space he needs to clear it. Let's see if I can flush out a bit of ice as we come ahead. The tide is rising now, so it gives us a little bit more water under the keel. But even with a storm on the way, the captain can't rush. Speed is the key thing here, that if you're going too fast and you hit the rudder with a huge piece of ice, then it's possible you could actually damage your rudder and damage the steering. Just coming ahead there now, Ken. I got a good clip on going to stern, so. Yeah, Roger. Once again, Captain Rose relies on his variable pitch propeller to move his ship back and forth in this tight space. 
All right, we're good to go now. You ready to go? We're ready to go. Is it flushing back? Captain Rose has pulled away from this dock hundreds of times, but it never gets any easier. I'm coming to stern on her. Push her on. Is it breaking up? Coming to stern. Coming to stern, very good. Free of the dock, Kumiak 1 finds her old track and begins the four-day trip back to Quebec City. But with a storm ahead, the captain can't let his guard down. It's a never-ending battle of worry on board. So hopefully uh, Lady Luck is with us a little bit today, but I got a feeling that uh, there's going to be a bit of swell week. You're not going to outrun it at all. For the next seven hours, Umiak enjoys calm seas. When we get the chance, we always like to come out and see, you know, see it all the ice, and I think mean, it's a beautiful day out, and we don't, there's no windows down the engine right down there. On the bridge, the captain is still thinking about what lies beyond the ice. As soon as we get outside of the edge, I got a feeling that uh, it's, it's really going to turn nasty. I can see the cloud cover just off the uh, off the horizon. Little uh, small piece there, fine on the board, Captain. Very small piece there. As Umiak 1 heads into open water, the crew braces for the waiting storm. Probably rolled a little. Yeah. Those sensors are mostly on the aft end. Yeah. On day two of the return voyage, a message comes through from head office. First job is the uh, prepare the ballast tanks. He wants to confirm the location of a sensor in the ballast tank. Umiak 1 is scheduled to undergo special maintenance back in Quebec City and the repair crew right. will need to know exactly where this sensor is located. To prevent any back injuries. Manual lifting logs will be used. So we're not going to get a chance to do it tomorrow. The weather's not great today. But well, this is the only time we're going to get a chance to do it, so... Are we ready to rumble? The captain and chief officer Kent Waddleton prepare to descend the 16 meters to the floor of the tank. Equipped with gas detectors, emergency breathing devices, a first aid kit and extra lights. If either man is injured or passes out, he'll have to be carried up several ladders from the confined space below. A tough assignment, especially in this weather. We got seas coming over on the uh, board side there now, and if they start rushing over on this side, we're gonna get wet, and water's gonna come there through, so we gotta get this done. For the crew on deck, there's nothing to do but wait and hope nothing goes wrong below. The floor is slippery, the ladders are ice cold, and the ship is rolling hard. Okay. The sensor is between uh, whip frame 135 and 136, and he is 30 centimeters, 30 centimeters from uh, whip frame 136. 30 centimeters from 136. It's time to get back on deck before the weather gets even worse. Get a close up, us. It was borderline, borderline to get done today, so I'm glad it's done and over with. I don't think we'll be doing the other side, not today. No, no definitely not. With, this, with the rolling and the swell, it's, uh, yeah. it's making it too slippery and too dangerous to be down there. But despite the rough seas, there's still work to be done, and one job is critical. The oxygen and nitrogen levels in the cargo holds have to be checked. Once again, Kent does the honours. Hello, Kent. Good morning, Okay, we're, uh, we're hitting uh, 156 there now. She seems to be pretty good. She's only if the oxygen level is too high, the nickel concentrate in the hold could catch fire. There are four different cargo holds to be checked, and Kent has to get the job done before nightfall. Moving around a wet deck in the dark is too dangerous. Yeah, Martin, now somebody uh, keep an eye on Kent as he, as he goes out. All right. Plugging into the first sensor port, Kent's gas detector reads the oxygen level. Anything over 8% is cause for concern. This reading is safe, just under 3%. 
Hello, Dale. Just write these on. Kent the is now right. joined by seaman Eddie Blackmore. Best to go up the starboard side today, Eddie. One more. Number five. 7.8. But in cargo hold five, the oxygen level is pushing the limit. Now we got some surf action here, ready? Kent suspects a leak in one of the nitrogen lines yes. that should be displacing the oxygen. Good. He's right. Uh, we have a leak in our ID line. He calls the engine room to have the escaping gas turned off. Hello, engine room. Yeah, okay, you're gonna have to shut down the, uh, the nitrogen, please. Shut down the nitrogen. This gives the repair crew time to deal with the problem before it gets too serious. OK, Roger, Derek, you can shut it down. We're good. For the moment, Roger. there's enough nitrogen in the hole to last until the line can be fixed tomorrow. OK, that's it, Eddie. We'll uh, shut the delivery there and we'll, uh, we'll get inside, get in off the deck. It takes a tough breed to work in these conditions. Sir, look at that. Who else can do this out here all day long, out here plowing around? Some people's cut out for it, some people's not. This boy were sailors. What's wrong with this? A little bit of swell coming over. Not wrong with it at all. That's what he's made for. This was all about. This is where he comes a sailor, makes a sailor out of a sailor. It's a man out here. <laughs> on day five of the return, Quebec City beckons on the horizon. It's always a good feeling knowing that you're uh, you're in port safe and sound. Cargo's all good, no damages to the ship or the cargo, so mission complete. There's just time for a crew photo. All right, let's get lined up, I guess. Who are we waiting on now? They don't complain. Uh, they've got to work in sub-zero temperatures all the time, a 12-hour day. It's a tough job, it really is. But uh, they seem to do it and, and more so enjoy it. <laughs> It's a good feeling to be on the ship where the crew are happy and motivated and uh, the job is getting done. In Quebec City, Umiak 1 will unload 30,000 tonnes of nickel concentrate, worth over $100 million. Then she'll load up once again for the next voyage to the mine. No matter what the weather throws at her, the world's most powerful ice-breaking bulk carrier will continue to do the one job for which she was built, keeping this remote corner of Canada alive.